How is everyone this evening? How, how many people know Tiffany Schlein? One, two, few. Um, how many people know about Seek Care? All right. <laughs> So for those who don't, uh, my name is Jim Doty. I'm the founder and director. And what we do is we have three parts of our mission. One is to do research to uh, understand the neural underpinnings of compassion and to find the value proposition, which I will tell you relates to uh, health, wellness, happiness, and longevity. And if you're interested in the science, please come to our website and we have a lot of articles and other information about that. The second part of our mission <clears throat> is educational or slash interventions. And what we do is we look at the latest neuroscience and then try to uh, develop techniques whereby one can potentiate their own genetic potential for compassionate behavior. Like happiness, we believe, and I think the science will bear this out eventually, is that there is a genetic uh, component to being compassionate, and probably half of it is, uh, uh, half of one's ability to be compassionate is genetically ordained, but then the other half uh, is probably environmental or can be uh, uh, potentiated through actually interventions. And we have developed a few. Uh, one is our Compassion Cultivation Training Program, which is a secularized um, eight-week program uh, that has its origins within a Tibetan compassion practice with input from PhD psychologists who uh, work in this arena. And uh, we have been doing scientific experiments to that to show you the, vo the value proposition of that intervention. And then we have another component of what we do, which isn't that well known yet because we're really just getting into that, which is applied psychological interventions, which are more cognitive based, based on the work of a fellow by the name of Paul Gilbert. But I believe each of these uh, uh, will allow individuals to be more self-compassionate, be more compassionate to other people, and by doing so, improves one li one's life, improve one's health, and ultimately uh, uh, improve one's degree of contentment and happiness. The third thing of what we do is what you're at today, or one of uh, the aspects of that, which is uh, we uh, show films, we have something called Conversations on Compassion, where we have a one, I have a one-on-one -on -one dialogue with, frankly, individuals who I just find interesting, who I would like to know. It's a very selfish thing, actually. Uh, and I get to hang out with them. But you all get to share in that conversation and ask questions. And uh, what we do know, in fact, the Dalai Lama has said that uh, this is one of the few times where one can be selfish when one is compassionate because when you're compassionate, what happens is that not only do you help another person, but you also benefit. And I try to do that as much as possible. Uh, so one is conversations on compassion, one is films such as this, and the other aspect of this third component uh, is we put on conferences, seminars. Uh, one of the things we do is we hold the largest conference, interdisciplinary conference of scientists who are working in this arena uh, called the Science of Compassion. We also hold the Summer Research Institute for graduate and postdoctoral students who are interested in this area. And uh, let's see, what else do we do? Uh, we just do cool stuff. Uh, uh, <clears throat> and one of, actually one of the conferences I'm excited about, which is happening December 6th, is uh, uh, Compassion and Technology. So we're actually having a contest. We're having people who have examined interventions that uh, improves one compassion, one's compassion, improves their health, and we're actually looking at people who are, can develop applications, either mobile-based, internet-based, or other, uh, that could have an impact on people's lives. So that conference is December 6th, <clears throat> which should be actually uh, pretty exciting. It's almost sold out, so if you're interested in attending, uh, better sign up soon. Uh, and we have some really great uh, people who are uh, uh, 
have signed up to for the prize that we're giving for that. Tonight, uh, I'm really honored uh, to present this film. Uh, it's called Connected, and you can see it's the autobiography of Love, Love, Death, and Technology. And for those who don't know Tiffany, uh, she is an award-winning filmmaker. Uh, she got her degree at UC Berkeley and was the valedictorian speaker, and also won the Eisner, Plot, bleh, Eisner Prize for uh, filmmaking. She, her films have won numerous awards, uh, and she has been called uh, something along the lines of one of the most interesting women to watch in the 21st century. So uh, a very fascinating uh, woman who I also uh, will tell you is a friend of mine. Uh, she's not going to be here till after the film because she's probably seen this film more than once. Uh, but uh, after the film, we're going to have a little conversation. She has a very interesting way in which she does her films, which is she pulls together a lot of data. She pulls together a lot of archival material and then presents it in a really interesting way, which uh, supports the message that she's trying to get. And obviously, this message is we are intimately, uh, irrevocably uh, connected uh, but is it always the way we wish to be connected or the way that uh, uh, that connection gives us the thing that we need the most? Because we do know that humans as a species, we thrive on connection, uh, but it's not necessarily that we thrive on all connections. And uh, so without further ado, we're going to start this film. And then uh, afterwards, we'll have a conversation with Tiffany and then I'll ask some incredibly penetrating, erudite, interesting questions, uh, or not. Uh, and then, uh, and hopefully we'll have some question and answers. So without further ado, thank you again for all being here. Uh, I appreciate it very much, and our team does. We have a great group of uh, volunteers and uh, people who I work with. Kelly's back there is one of them. Where are, where are our volunteers? Is that right there? So we only have two tonight, but there are many more involved in this. But Without them, none of the work that we do could really actually happen. I'm just a front person for these people. I really don't do squat, but, uh, 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 but that's okay. I honor them, and I'm thankful that they uh, honor me with uh, working with me. So thank you. I already introduced Tiffany, but this is Tiffany here in person. And um, she's got a few things to share with us, and then we're going to sit down and uh, have a little bit of a conversation and it's sort of interesting, isn't it, uh, the, uh, the sort of the autobiography here, which is on many levels representing what all of us have faced or are facing in our own lives, and also uh, the reality of the fact that this is a shared experience because we are all connected. So without further ado, my friend Tiffany. Thank you. Um. A lot of wires coming off of me. Um, you know, That's I had made eight films before I made this one. I had never been in one of my films. But the best part, as scary as that was, which it was, hi, my cousin's in the house. <laughs> um, <laughs> as scary as it was, I'm not gonna, this is like my umbilical cord, I'm not gonna untangle it. Um, is that when I come into a theater after showing it, is I feel so connected to all of you, because um, my mom's a psychologist, and she says success distances you from people, but tragedies bring you closer with people. So um, anyone who's lost someone really important to them can relate. So anyways, I'm really happy to be here talking about compassion. I, I don't, maybe we could kind of intersprinkle. I brought some of some newer short projects that really pick up where, you know, Connected was finished a couple years ago. And so maybe we can talk and then I can occasionally yeah, sure. go to the, because you're right here. I feel so lucky to be talking to you. Maybe we should just talk and I'll, I'll show stuff in between. So Tiffany and I have gotten to know each other, I guess over the last year or two or yeah. few years. And in fact, it's interesting because uh, there's actually a project on neuroscience and uh, uh, the humanities, I guess. And uh, unbeknownst to either of us, uh, the process of that project actually reintroduced us again. So Tiff and I are, are working 
on a project uh, in that area. But maybe I can just start a little bit, and uh, this will sort of lead us along here. Um, obviously, you have had and, and continue to have a very close relationship with your father. And it's actually probably uh, one that uh, is really, uh, I, I think, probably one that not that many people actually share in the context of their own parents. Uh, I can tell you from myself, I certainly did not have that same connection, but it's really wonderful to see that. But the other side of that, of course, is uh, it has brought you and made you what you are, brought you here, yeah. but that connection and losing that connection, at least the physical aspect of that connection, mm -hmm. especially during uh, the bringing a new life into the world, uh, we yeah. see part of that experience. Yeah, you know, a couple thoughts. I knew that I had a really special relationship with my dad, and people would always comment on it, and I was so careful with not wanting to make anyone feel bad that didn't have that with their dad. And um, I was really conscious of that, because I have a lot of girlfriends that, you know, and that didn't have that. But I really hoped, you know, my favorite moments at screenings, and this is screened all over the world. I've been in Cape Town, South Africa with this film, going to Israel next month with it. I will inevitably have several men come up to me and say, you showed me what being a good father looks like. Or people will say, you showed me what unconditional love looks like. And um, so that is that part, because I was really mindful of that. Just as I'm very mindful of women with infertility after going through, you just become like your compassion, your senses, your empathy, your antennas are, my antennas are up about all of those things. And then the other thing I'll tell you that, you know, I am now four years away. I know exactly how long my dad's been gone because my daughter was born just days after him, but he's with me in such a bigger way now. I mean, I, I just, he's everywhere. Like, I, I just was outside and then somebody just seen the film, he's like, I heard your dad speak here seven years ago in the humanities school and I just feel like he's, I mean, there was the grieving and the very painful um, grieving that I really worked through a lot in this film but I do feel like he's in a bigger way with me now. So anyone going through the pain of losing someone, it does get to this beautiful higher place. And I, and I you know that saying that I thought I understood someone lives on in you and you, you say it and you heard it, but you don't really feel it until you're like, oh yeah, I get that. The guy, he's, the memories and yeah, so. Well, it's interesting though, because in some ways though, it manifests our ability to uh, actually paint the picture that we want to paint yeah. uh, in the sense that, uh, um, and I've shared this with some of you in different one of my talks, but myself growing up, uh, I had an experience when I was 13 with a woman who really changed my own perception and uh, by spending some time with her. And at that time, uh, I uh, was sort of lost and uh, that interaction with that person profoundly affected how I see the world. And I think these types of experiences, which are the nature of life, uh, uh, you can yourself decide which direction it's going to lead you. I was actually with a young man today in his uh, early 20s, and his mother had heard me speak. And, uh, um, he was actually going through a very difficult time of depression. And we sat and talked for a while, and I'm not saying that that one interaction dramatically affected him because I don't know, but it was really interesting to speak to somebody because uh, his own perception of the world is so dark in some ways, mm -hmm. but then after about 15 or 20 minutes, you could just see the light starting to shine again and uh, I think we all have that within us to change that. And this, mm -hmm. in some ways, is about changing your brain. Um, yeah, there's a film that um, we are just premiering, a new film called The Science of Character. Oh, I showed you that one. Yes, you did. <laughs> yeah, but I'm it's, stealing from it. <laughs> but it's all about new um, social science and neuroscience and how you can um, 
develop your character and go from kind of a fixed mindset to a growth mindset and believe you can change and change your perspective and your work on your strengths. So that one's coming out in a couple months. Um, I've worked on a lot. Since this film, I wanted to put a lot of the ideas in the film into action. So um, the last line of the movie is, perhaps it's time to declare our interdependence. So um, I thought, well, what if I write a declaration of interdependence? And what if I asked people to read it? And what would that look like? And so we invited people to send us artwork and videos from all over the world. And it just, uh, so we decided to make these new films called Cloud Films. And they're very, when we make free versions for nonprofits. And um, I wanted to show you one. It's just two minutes. I'm going to, that was the Declaration of Independence, but there's a line about compassion in that one. But this one, um, do we have volume? Oh, yeah, we have volume. So I've started to experiment really with reaching out to humanity and saying, make a film with me and let's make a film about the things that connect us. So whereas connected was talking about it, this is actually doing it. So this is one of our cloud films. Pon la mano en tu corazón. That's your life clock. Someday, it's going to stop. A lot of things are going to happen in the world between now and then. So what are you going to do while you're here? Stand on the sidelines? Or are you going to be part of something bigger? These are these new kind of experiments with tapping into compassion and interdependence and humanity to actually make films from them. So it's been a really interesting journey. You know, I wonder, and I, I think you'll probably agree, that I'm sure it wasn't that difficult to get people, is it? You know, everyone wants to be part of something, humans. Mm -hmm. Humans want to be part of something bigger than themselves. It actually gives me great hope that you know, you just need to create a, a strong framework, but that everyone, want, whenever we do these cloud films, when you see these entries, it's, it's so beautiful how many people want to make a film with us. It's great, yes. People want to make something. Well, I think it's, uh, you know, each of us wants to, I mean, some of the things you talked about, which is interesting in this idea of a different paradigm, which I think was part of the subtext here, is on the one hand, as a species, one of the things that has allowed us to survive, and one, and this is based on this, uh, what Tiffany's film was talking about, the enlargement of the brain for different components, including abstract thinking, complex language, if you will, theory of mind. Uh, you know, your brain did enlarge, and this required this, this requirement uh, for the mother to nurture the child, and it created this this maternal bond or familial bond. And then as we evolved as a species, and even until 10,000 years ago, our primary survival strategy 
was in groups of 10 to 50 as hunter-gatherers. And again, that same tribal instinct, that small group, which allowed us to survive in a harsh world, unfortunately, uh, you know, evolution sort of goes like this. Technology and modernity go like this. And we have a lot of leftovers which are not going to allow us to survive. And part of this is this tribal instinct. And this is where, uh, and one of the great things about technology now is it's making us see this interdependence. Mm -hmm. But we have to overcome this genetic component which uh, results in many of us, if not most of us, associating with people who think like us, look like us, mm -hmm. are like us, yet that's not the world, is it? And there's some interesting research being done by uh, David DeSteno and others, which recognizes this reality and then talks about techniques, how to overcome that. And in fact, we can overcome that, but it's not a natural instinct. You know, I went to this talk last night uh, where he was talking about Benjamin Franklin and how much he believed that, I get, he supported like churches, temples, and mosques. He was like the greatest supporter of diversity of thinking and he really believed that it was the bedrock of this country. And I've been reading a lot about um, Matt Ridley, who wrote this book called The Rational Optimist, which talked about how innovation always happens in cities because it's the most people from different perspectives that are bumping up against each other and solving problems just because they had to. So I feel like the internet in a lot of ways is creating this place for all these different perspectives to bump up against each other. And um, so that's where I get hopeful because the, the place that I bump up a lot uh, with a lot of interesting ideas that I wouldn't normally come across. So they say that Facebook is who you went to school with and Twitter is who you wished you went to school with. <laughs> is there any people on Twitter here? Because people knock Twitter. In fact, I need to twit. And, the, so you need tweet to twit. This tweet. Yeah. I, I know a lot of twits. <laughs> I need to find tweets. But the um, thing that most people don't get about Twitter, if you're not on it, is you follow people you find interesting in what they're looking at. And I get a lot of diversity of opinions that I don't think I find normally. So I really love it for that. But um, it, it, I'm doing, I just premiered a new film series called The Future Starts Here, and there's eight episodes. You can watch them all for free on AOL. Um, and there is an episode called Idea Porn, which is kind of about what we were just talking about with the racy title, but it is about the intersection of ideas and how those create new ideas. And That's great. I can say that with kids in the house. I'm uh, so glad there were kids in the house, by the way. How old are you guys? How old are you? You look like the age of my daughter. <laughs> awesome. Wonderful. I love that. You know, it's interesting, though, uh, the, sort of the downside of, of Benjamin Franklin is, and I don't know if you read this, was he had a view, uh, in part, that uh, the average person didn't have the, uh, actually, the intellectual ability right to there. make decisions, and that, in fact, uh, 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 and it was obviously a very elitist attitude, uh, which was that uh, really the people who should be making decisions for society should be a group of people who are highly educated right. and thoughtful. Now, I don't know if Ted Cruz, who went to Princeton and Harvard, <laughs> <laughs> uh, represents that, because if it does, I'm not quite sure yeah. that is the solution, although I'm sorry if there are any Republicans here. Uh, 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 but uh, so it, it, it is sort of interesting. Uh, well, uh, interdependent systems require diversity to and, survive. And, the, and that's the wonderful thing, I think, is that this is the greatest thing that will allow our species to, to survive is diversity because right. when we're talking about these tribal states and where you hang around with the same people that ultimately especially in our modern society is a prescription uh, for the end of our species mm -hmm. and I think as each of us are exposed more and I think we see this within cities within places like here where there's a diversity of ideas there's a respectful uh, conversation about these ideas it allows us each to uh, be more open. I was just with Thich Nhat Hanh the other day, and we were talking about compassionate listening. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the challenges for a lot of us is, you know, when you see somebody who has a different idea set than you, 
a lot of us have an emotional reaction, right? Because it's a high idea yeah. we hold dear versus leaning forward and actually listening to people. And I, I have no question if I sat down with Ted Cruz as much as I made that joke, that he has a real basis for why he thinks what he thinks, as does anyone who has an idea. Uh, and it's just being open to listening to them and being respectful of that. And once you start a dialogue, I think it yeah. allows you to have a better conversation. You know, I think that women, um, I find this with women more than men, going to make my, my research on my life. Just that women, when they connect, go straight for the thing that connects them. Like my husband, like I'll go and meet a woman, and and my husband, like, how did you how did you go there so quickly? And women often, I feel like, go for the thing that connects them to that other person, whatever their viewpoint is, whether they're a mother or whether there's a heart. I just think that women, that's why there should be more women leaders, in general. But because I think women come from a more um, a place of wanting to connect. I, I think you're right. In fact, uh, just to plug my own interest in this topic, uh, uh, <laughs> I actually gave a talk at, at, at the UN uh, recently at a TEDx talk. I don't know if any of you have seen it, but it was actually about uh, uh, women's empowerment, gender equality, and compassion. I like and, that. Uh, uh, and really, it, no, it was it about is. this because women are, I think, more open to yeah. this. And I think, as you pointed out, uh, in our society now, in, in fact, the Dalai Lama said Western women are going to be the, uh, will save humanity. And uh, I won't argue with that. And I think it's true, actually. Well, I, I actually think that the web plays to women's greatest strengths because it's collaborative, it's empathetic, and I think that um, it just plays to a lot of strengths. Not that, you know, we're all on a spectrum of everything. Um, so, but I, but I do get hopeful. I mean, in my father's book, he was very hopeful. He was very optimistic that the image-based culture and the rise of the web and using both, both hands to type is activating all parts of your brain and that this was going to bring a more equilibrium to society. And um, I should tell you that his book, this is new news. So that book that he was writing and, and, and he finished and... Um, he passed away with a 500-page manuscript. Now, when he wrote books before, there were 500-page books. There are no longer those kind of big, long books. So we had to get it edited. We had to get the rights back from the publisher. We got the rights back. We got it edited. We got a new editor. And this week, we got a final offer. That book's going to be published. It's been like pushing a boulder up a mountain. But we're so excited. Um, he has some really interesting ideas about looking at Leonardo da Vinci, which you saw in the film. But Anyways, just When's had to give book? that update. When's the book coming out? Well, it's going to be out um, in the next year. Oh, you know, wonderful. books take a long time. Believe me. Uh, you know, you've got a good new book coming out. Yeah, so uh, it's like. <laughs> books are like. Uh, it's, it's birthing. It is, and, but uh, we. Um, and my hips are too small and narrow, <laughs> I think. It, it, uh, um, and you know, one of the other things, so this new film series I did, I meant, there's like one line in the movie about it. I feel like I need to update you on everything since I made the movie about it. There's one line in the movie that said we started unplugging one day a week. I have to tell you, it's been almost four years now that we have, my family unplugs for one day a week. It's totally changed our lives. I think a lot about, I hope we explore this in the installation we're doing together, but I mean, taking one day off a week from technology is just, it has had a profound effect on my happiness, my level of feeling centered, and my whole family, and doing something together with the family no one's nagging each other to get off a device for a whole day. And um, it's been a really, so my, the new film series I start, I, I start with that episode because it was such a big deal to me to put my mind in a different mode of thinking for one, for one whole day every week. Well, you know, I think what happens is, and whether we realize it or not, this, this, inner, this, this connectivity we have uh, is addictive, right? Mm -hmm. More so than, a, did any of you guys read the article about Oreos? No, is it more addictive than yeah, Oreos? Yeah, Oreos are, are, are more, than more trans addictive fats? than cocaine. <laughs> so uh, your cell phone's more addictive than Oreos, apparently. But uh, uh, you, because you get these little dopamine kicks, and, it, and that's why you went to the, had to go to the bathroom to yeah. look at your, your device. And 
it, it's, so it, there is great hope for connectivity and this incredible power that we have, but there's also a danger. I don't know if you saw this study, but there was a study that was done, and, and we actually have, believe it or not, uh, controlled ways to create stress in mm -hmm. people, not just in our jobs, but... <laughs> just but, texting someone yeah. over and over again. Uh, but uh, so there's this, this standardized test, and, and it was done on, on teenage girls. And the girls were given, were stressed, and then they were given the opportunity to either do the following, speak with their mother uh, by telephone, actually physically engage in person with their mother, or to text their mother about what was happening in this stressful incident. And so, as we talked about, when you connect with another person who you care about, you have this release of oxytocin, which gives you this warm, bonding, love type of connection. So, guess what happened? So, with uh, uh, when they talked to their mother, of course, their oxytocin levels went up way high. When they actually talked on the telephone and heard their mother's voice, their oxytocin went high. When they texted it in. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. It's interesting, because they just came out with a big study yesterday about um, children and screen time, and they're now saying Skyping is actually okay, because they get the hits of, uh, that they are getting responses from Skyping when they see their grandparents. The facial recognition, well, I mean, it's the, fa it's the eye contact. Yeah, exactly. And, and this is really an important thing, and uh, many of you probably know the work of Paul Ekman. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think, uh, uh, and, it, and in fact, I think this even this example you just gave shows, and I give a talk sometimes uh, about this reality, and this gets back to this tribe and connection. When with the, if there is somebody you love, they can walk into a room, and they do not have to say one word, and you can tell whether they had a shitty day or not, can't you? Mm -hmm. Or if they had a good day, without anything because you are so attuned to their facial movements, their body stance, their body habitus, how they look at you. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know the person, you don't have that. And this is the key about connection, mm -hmm. because when you're around somebody a lot, you, you get that, and that's what we're attuned to. Mm -hmm. And these micro movements, which uh, a lot of us actually don't appreciate, uh, are amazing. Now, you know, the other thing I said about tribe and oxytocin fits in here. So we know that if you identify with a group and you take a hit of intranasal oxytocin, you get this incredible warm feeling about those people. But guess what happens if you take oxytocin and they're not in your group? And in fact, it works a little bit the opposite. Mm -hmm. So again, this is overcoming this uh, ability to sort of be contained and be exclusive. It protects us in certain environments, but in the big scope of our interdependent world. Hmm. That's interesting. Andrew, I can't wait to tell him about this idea. I want to hear it. Let's hear it. Should I yeah, say it in front of everyone? Uh oh. Well, well, maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe you should text me first. And tell me what. <laughs> well, okay, here's the idea. Okay, so we have been, so UCSF has paired artists with neuroscientists, neurosurgeon together. So, Here's the concepts. See what you think. Is um, there's new there's new portable brain scanners. So I want people to go into a photo booth, and based on your re and you know all of your research about how much compassion is so good physiologically for you, and I want to show people how when they look at violent images, what that does to their brain versus looking at images that are beautiful or people they love or. So I want to have them have their helmet on and go into this photo booth where we'll have a montage of like images of compassion versus of images of violence, and then have them get a, like a little brain portrait to show them the difference. Um, and because I feel like people need to be, you know, when you turn on the news, you are listening to violence, violence, violence. Now, while I believe you need to be aware of the world around you, the media is playing completely to your amygdala, which is very in primal, you know, the amygdala tells you you're about to be killed, you better pay attention, focus. So the media is all trying to get your attention. So they're playing to your fears. So if you're only listening to the radio and the news, usually it's like the worst of humanity. And I believe that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
and it just builds up this stress and these images and that people need to be more conscious that everything they watch and everything they listen to is affecting the connections in their brain and that you can be empowered to go, you know, that's not the only channel I'm going to listen to on this world. I don't believe, I look around my world, it doesn't look like the world they're showing me on the news. So I think if we showed like some kind of cool booth that, that showed them how affected they were and then with Meditation, I love all the stuff you talk about, how profound it's been, and all the effects that can have. So what do you think about that? No, I think it's a great idea. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a wonderful damn idea. <laughs> it's an you're, audience. You have to say so you like it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, There's a lot of parts that need to yeah. be worked out. Well, but. Uh, but, but actually, it's, it's interesting. Uh, do you know um, Cliff Saren? No. So Cliff Saren has done something. Have any of you heard of the Sh Shamata Project? Uh, so look up Cliff Saren and Shamata, although I don't know how to spell it. I think it's S-A-M-A-T-H-A. Anyway, uh, so Cliff has actually uh, done something like this because what they're trying to do is to uh, see how a certain type of meditation and focus uh, has an effect on your brain, and he shows them different images. Hmm. And, uh, um, and it has a huge impact. And in fact, uh, you know, when you see what it does to your brain, uh, you can certainly relate to that. And as you were saying, and is people will be more conscious. Yeah, if they can see, if, if here, in some ways, it's like that commercial. Here's yeah, your here's brain your on brain on drugs. drugs. Right. No, I think it's. Well, like, I think about Clockwork Orange. Yeah. And that's a bad, scary movie, but <laughs> but I, we are being. We're like our. I think as a society, our eyes are up with toothpicks, working, watching the worst all the time. The, the, yeah, and the reality is that 98% of people are wonderful. Yeah. They are trying to live lives. They're trying to live connected lives. They want a better life. world for their children. They want... And it's exactly as you said, because the bad thing about uh, us, and this is, again, we talk about holdovers. Have any of you seen uh, this book called Brain Bugs? It's like the holdover from the... Like... Yeah, it's the evolutionary holdovers of why we think mm -hmm. the way we do, and it's not a perfect system. So as you were talking about the amygdala and this fright or flight mechanism, you know, our DNA is fundamentally not changed from what it was 200,000 yeah. years ago. So when we were on the savanna, and what was the thing that, you know, you've thought about three things. You know, I was actually giving a, a talk the other day in a church, and I said, is it okay to say sex in the church, you know? Uh, and I guess it was because the pastor in front of me was the one who picked the word out. So, but anyway, uh, but you know, at that time you thought about sex, you thought about food, you thought about shelter, security, and then you were attuned to a lion that might eat you. And this is where, how the system was developed, this flight or fight mechanism, this amygdala. But it's been hijacked in some ways by modern technology, and in, it's being manipulated by uh, the media. The media. It's being manipulated by politics. Because unless there's a fear-based mm -hmm. response, it's not going to get your attention. And the best thing politicians think they can do, scare which is so the, opposite scare of what of would happen if they took a different approach, is they want you to be afraid, and they want you to join their tribe, yeah. and it's you against them. and uh, and. That is not an effective long-term strategy, and science has borne this out. Uh, actually, uh, Dr. Sapolsky here has done studies with certain types of primates about this. A fear-based uh, strategy is a short-lived survival strategy. Only by cooperation hmm. do you get the long-term survival of a species. Yeah, I was really struck when I was researching this film when Darwin said, you know, you always hear survival of the fittest, but he actually talks about the cooperation was the success of the species, which well, and, and you, it gets buried, that aspect of his work. Because what happened was that that statement was made by an economist who had a different agenda. Yeah. And in fact, he, he said that survival of the most sympathetic, which he meant actually. Yeah. Uh, Out of uh, context. Passionate. Yes. Exactly. Do we want to take it, maybe open it up to see if any of the audience has questions? No. <laughs> Do I mean? Do you? Any of you want to? Uh, if you have questions, why don't you go ahead and go on up? <laughs> We're just going to be self-indulgent. No, no. I mean, we could. I love talking to him. We could just go. Yeah. Maybe you should repeat the question. Yeah. What, what do I think technology has brought that moves things forward? Well, I think that it has. You know, it's always like. Technology is us. Like a lot of people talk about technology as if it's this, 
other thing. It's us. You know, it's like we couldn't see far enough. We invented the telescope. We wanted to speak to people further. We invented the telephone. And Marshall McLuhan talked about this, like extensions of us. So technology is our desire to connect with minds and people all over the world. So, and, and, and we are good, bad, and everything in between. So we are actually showing in all these internet networks and everything our inherent interdependence, which is biologically, economically, environmentally. It's already there, and I feel like we've created this. I try to show it in the film. I hope it, you know, and then that, that's why I kind of reverse the film all the way in the end and go back to the Big Bang, because it's like we're all one. We're all from the same thing, and all of these technologies are just reconnecting us in a visual way. I mean, when I first started making this film, the word connected was not out there. Now it's like every ad campaign for everything is connected. But when I was making the film, really, it was like five or six years ago, that was not a word. And suddenly, I'll connect with you later. Let's link to this. And, and every ad is connected. And it's really an amazing thing. Because it's like we are putting out there this thing that's intrinsic to our nature. Yeah, we are creating it. And every email you write to someone new, you are like creating a new synapse in this global brain. I mean, I feel like we are creating a global structure to transmit ideas. So I really, I explore this a lot. I made a film called Brain Power from Neurons to Networks, which is a 10 minute film, cloud film, where I invited people to, um, uh, and it's based on a lot of neuroscience and how to best develop the brain. And I compared that to the development of the internet. But I believe we are actually creating a global brain. And right now, we have only 2 billion people online. So we won't see the full potential of this global brain. And I don't mean the brain's going to think one thought. But as you can confirm, our brains don't think one. I mean, how many times your brain is like a, it's constantly fighting with the things you want and the things you don't do and you do. And it's like in constant. So I feel like we are working towards 7 billion people online. I think it's going to happen in like eight years. And that's amazing that we are going to be, all of us in this room will be alive to see every person on the planet that wants to be connected, connected, and have access to every bit of wisdom that we've accumulated since the beginning of civilization. That is amazing. That's what we're doing right now, all of us in this room. And if you can be mindful of that and say, we need to make sure we get everyone online, we need to make sure we're not sending crap out there all the time. And I mean, That's impossible. Well, my films, like this new film series, they're all three to six minute films. I'm really trying to elevate the conversation. Like, with short films on the internet, because I know everyone's very busy. I'm so glad you guys came out and watched a whole movie. But it, in this, film, this film series was released two weeks ago. And in two weeks, millions of people have watched it on their cell phones. So I'm really just trying to trigger conversations. So however way that happens to kind of help us evolve. I mean, I, I really believe that human, I believe in humans. I think I should start with that. I think a lot of people don't believe in us right now. And it's weird to me. Because if you want us to be the best and like evolve, you have to believe in ourselves and humanity as a whole. So I believe we are evolving to be all connected. And, and people will say, oh, all this horrible stuff will happen. Again, I believe 98% of the people do not want that to happen. The other, uh, you know, it's interesting because we talk about violence. And for people who watch TV, you think, God, we have to have the most violent age Ugh, in yeah. the world. But there's actually a book by. Uh, Steven Peter, Pinker. It's Steven Pinker, and it's called The, the, the better, Angels of Our Better, better Nature. Sure. Yeah, but it, it, it actually shows that, in fact, this is the least violent time of our species compared to the overall population. So, Can I wait? I have a perfect little thing to show now. Can I show you a couple minute up. thing? We set this we up. We didn't set it up, but I wasn't going to show this. But If you just watched the news today, you would think the world is going to hell. Maybe it's time to change the channel. I'm Tiffany Schlein. I'm a mother, filmmaker. I founded the Webby Awards. And this series is about how the future doesn't start somewhere far off in the distance. The future starts here. I'm up on all the news, but I don't leave the radio or television on because I have children. And all they seem to show is rape, murder, war. I mean, you know that everything you watch and listen to is influencing the synaptic connections in your brain. So if you're only hearing about the worst of humanity, which most of the news is, you're actually strengthening certain connections in your brain and weakening others. I mean, there's always going to be dark things happening in the world that, of course, we need to respond to. And there's always going to be news, books, movies, and friends and family 
that imagine the worst things that can happen. But we could also choose to focus on the good, the potential of humanity, the progress we've made. Not in a Pollyanna way, but with a good understanding of the past, looking critically at our history and how far we've come. My husband Ken and I like to call ourselves Opticists. Optimism with a healthy dose of skepticism. Steven Pinker in his recent book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, shows mathematically how the rate of violence around the world has actually declined throughout history. So prehistoric people had about a 50% chance of being killed by another human. And that's obviously not the case today. His theory about why we perceive the world as being so violent is first because the news only reports what does happen and not what doesn't happen. And secondly, that we just care more about each death, that we're more connected and empathetic than ever before. If you just focus on the negative, that can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, when really there are so many positive things we could focus on, the progress we've made, imagining strengthening those neural pathways. Sure, you could focus on the setbacks and the inequalities, but we've also joined together to respond to them. Humanity is moving forward. We're making new tools all the time that are helping us work together and collaborate on these challenges, and we have throughout history. When we were cold and we needed to eat, we invented fire. That was the technology of its day. When we couldn't see far enough, we invented the telescope. When we wanted to speak to people far away, we invented telephones. When we craved more knowledge, we created a computer, an extension of our brains that sits on our desk and now in our hands. And now, wanting to connect and collaborate with minds all over the world, we've created the internet, which is like this extension of our hearts and our minds. Technology has always been an extension of us, an extension of our powers as humans, a way for us to shape the world around us into what we want and need it to be. Our desire to evolve makes me think of this city called Brasilia built in 1960 in Brazil to be this city of the future. And they built it thinking that no one would want to walk around anymore because everyone would be driving cars. Well, it turns out that people created their own pathways. People wanted to walk. And they saw something built that wasn't working, and their human desire was to create paths. Architects call it the desire path. They love that idea. And I think that the more that society's old structures aren't working, the more we have to think about where we want to be heading and work together to create that pathway. Humans are everything. We're good, we're bad, we're everything in between. But ultimately, I believe that humans are good. We have to believe in ourselves. We have to believe in humanity. Whenever you think about how was someone able to do something big and bold, well, usually that person will say, because someone believed in me a parent, a teacher, a mentor, just someone believed in them and allowed them to do more than they could. Well, if we want humanity to be better, we have to believe in us. We have to believe that we are good, that we are evolving, and that we can continue to make the world better. So let's strengthen our collective optimism. No, let's strengthen our collective opticism. The future starts right here with us. That was kind of so many things we talked about. Okay. So that that's the last it's the last episode of like these eight short films that we just released, which you can watch online. Yeah. Um, you know, you're extremely creative and I enjoyed everything you've done. How do you finance the, your uh, projects? For example, that project. How would, where do you... um, well, Connected, first of all, thank you. Um, Connected was a combination of investors and grants, and we send them, we're just about to do our investor report. It's doing really well, Connected is. And then um, the cloud films, I got a very large anonymous grant to make these films for nonprofits. And then the AOL series, in January, they approached me and said, you know, we, we love your work, we want you to do a film series. And I was like, I never make films for other people, <laughs> I said. And I was working on the film, The Science of Character. And we're funded for the next two years. We have films we're working on. And I said, thank you, but no thank you. And they kept saying, you can have complete creative control, nice budget. They're doing one with Sarah Jessica Parker and Gwyneth Paltrow. And they're like, you're the idea person. You get to do the idea one. And I'm like, whatever I want. And i like, whatever you want. And I actually called my mentor, who, who first introduced us, Anna Devere Smith. And I said, what do you think? I, I'm busy. I, 
I don't want to work harder than I am. And she said, Tiffany, five years ago, it would be the film studios offering you this. Now it's AOL. She's like, elevate the conversation. That's what you always want to do. Go ahead and elevate it. Put important stuff out there. And then I did it. And I had a blast. And they kept their word. I'm tackling all sorts of subjects in these shorts. And like I said, the crazy thing is, is that they're seeing, I mean, it's one of their hit shows. And the fact that people are listening to that instead of watching reality TV makes me happy. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hmm, that's a great question. Where do I go for inspiration and delight? I have an episode called The Creative Process in 10 Acts. And I talk about my creative process. And one of them I call the sponge. And I, you know, I go through real periods. Like I have been in a total head down making these, and now I'm about to come up. And I, I, you know, I love movies. I love to read. I, um, I love magazines. I, I'm like a lover of culture. But you know, I'm a working mom, so um, it comes in spurts. I always go on a date night on Saturday night. We usually see a film or just go to an art show. I love Pinterest. I love Twitter. And um, I see a lot of films. But I just, I feel like everything's inspiring. I, you know, the fact that you can have your phone with you, they can take a picture of anything, that, a moment that inspires you. But I'm pretty inspired by, I love all the tools available today. Um, and you can see a lot of my films are made from other, I don't shoot a lot. Um, and so for me, there's so much more available now to me. I'm like a kid in a candy store. Um, well, we're Jewish, so we do it Friday night to Saturday night. So we always did, we do Shabbat. We do a beautiful dinner on Friday night. But that was usually about it. And then when my father got sick, I was like, we need to take this up a notch. Like, I want us for 24 hours to turn all screens off. So um, I, I kind of show exactly our ritual in the first episode, which you can watch, called Technology Shabbats. But it's, it's huge. Anyone can do it. In the episode, I talk about every religion has a day off. Like that used to be the norm, and now it's just crept into why are we? My staff loves it. They don't get even, you know, no one, no one should, when people say, oh, my kid is a student, they couldn't unplug on the weekends. Yes, your kid should. Your kid should have one day off. People say, my bosses won't. You'd be surprised. I respect people when they're like, I'm not an email on the weekends, or they push back on that instant response time, and I think people need to ask for it more. I think it's too, I also don't believe you should keep these near your bed. I think the last thing you see, you know, it could be a nice email, it could be one that's gonna stress you out and work their way into your dreams, make you sleep poorly. Don't use it as an alarm clock. I'm sure there's studies on that. If you're a doctor, don't keep your cell phone on. Well, my brother will say to me, because I come from a doctor's family, so Jordan's like, I could never unplug, because I'm on call. And I, you know, when my father, when I was growing up, he was a surgeon, so I used to go to the movie, we went to the movies every week, and when his beeper would go off back then, you were either a doctor or a drug dealer. Or both. Or, or both. both. And um, it was a big deal when your beeper went off oh, in the yeah. movie theater, right? And we would always go to the emergency room. It was always very exciting and dramatic. And, but there's very, I even think my brother, and if you, I mean, do you ever take a day off? Oh, no, no, I do. You I, do? I, I, I mean, of course I take a day off. And, and They've I, even found that doctors that are up, they used to do the, you know, keeping the doctors up for two days. I mean, that's Meshuggana. It's, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't so, think no, no, no. I, you, nobody can be on 24 But I, I just think as a society, we need to raise up and say, enough. It's too much. It's like, it's not good. It's not healthy to be on all the time, to, to be available to everybody all the time instead of being available to yourself and your family and the people you love. And this is the paradox, right? So on the one hand, we're talking about this interdependence and being completely connected, and then on the other hand... But that's about evolving our mindfulness, which is about meditation, well, yeah. No, no, that's, my point is the best way to connect, though, is, uh, I mean, having it off for a while, and that's how you get deep, true connection. Mm -hmm. uh, the other can inform, I think, but... And in some instances, I think you can have true deep connection long distance. We're talking about Skype and seeing people. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there can also be an artificiality to that connection too, right? I mean, having a thousand friends on Facebook is not having friends. Right? Yeah. I think, I think I get what you're, I, I feel like I'm not ignorant and I don't have shielders on, but I do think that we have to be mindful on what we're taking in. I feel like we have to be mindful. And I'm an activist. I mean, I am very involved in a lot of causes 
with violence against women. And is it, so there's a way you can engage, but I think what I'm more talking to is that we all have a choice. We all have a choice of what we're putting in our brain. I actually, at the beginning of the year, took a real mindful approach to curating what was going in my brain on Facebook and the news I was watching. And I started like really curating so that I wasn't getting so much stimulation that I didn't think was good for my brain. Well, you know, my channel is through my films. You know, like I can show these films in, on, you know, places where, like I said when I walked in, like I have found my medium is to share, you know, my story in the most authentic way I can and connect with all of you. So again, I think it's going back to what you're talking about, about tribalness. I mean, it's all there. But I think on the whole arc of history, it's, we're in a really good place. And I think that perspective is important, because if you just watch certain channels, you wouldn't know that. So there are pockets of that. But I think that on the whole, that is not the case. I'm just about to go to the Middle East. The State Department is sending me to the Middle East in two weeks with my movies. And I am going to be showing Connected and Brain Power and various films. It was supposed to be Egypt and Israel for two weeks. And then, it, and then it got so violent in Egypt, they just made it Israel. But I'm going to Galilee. I'm sure it's going to be super tense. I'm Jewish. It's going to be to Arabs and uh, Israelis. But I'm going to show my movie. And you know what? Everyone who's lost a parent, or they're going to connect with me through my story. And then we're going to have a good conversation. And I'm going to teach them how to make cloud movies so they can tell their own stories. So like, that's my way. I mean, I know a film's going to come out of the Middle East. Like, I just like, can feel it. Like, I'm going on a mission. And I don't even, but you know, that is, like, that's such a tough place. And being a Jew, it's very complicated. And I feel like I'm going in there with just compassion and my story and honesty to try to kind of break down those barriers. You know, the other comment about what you say is, you know, there are invariably going to be these isolated pockets of extremism. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just the way it is. And, and, uh, but the amazing thing is they're isolated pockets, right? Mm -hmm. You don't see s cities of hundreds of thousands of people who want to force every 13 or 14 year old to carry a gun, a gun and be armed. Uh, you know, you don't see uh, you know, large population, because these are very, very small groups of extreme people. And even if you, you know, people try to demonize Muslims, the, the fanatics, uh, again, it, the people who are pushing this crazy agenda, it's really a very small percentage of people as much as, again, using the fear-based media, they want to create a perception that every Muslim has some agenda to uh, mm -hmm. destroy America and uh, any Christians. Uh, it just, that's not the way it is. I, I mean, you can interpret these uh, uh, religious texts in a variety of different ways, right? And the reality is the vast majority of people, uh, their interpretation is one of kindness and compassion because that's really at the core of all of this and then the other is baggage, if you will. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I don't think that, well, all, all you say is true, we're not gonna see. I mean, those pe they last for a while and there's so much pressure and so much other forces on these people that either they destroy themselves or it's just not a, a, a survivable uh, a paradigm. It just doesn't work. I think uh, really, unfortunately, that's all the yeah. time we have this evening. I really want to thank, thank you. you. And thank you, Tiffany, my dear.